You're listening to The Dossier, presented by Metro by T-Mobile. Any homicide investigator will tell you that in pursuit of closing a cold case, you need to track down every lead, every theory, and every shred of evidence. One thing in investigating this case for the past few years that hasn't sat right with me was the work of LAPD investigator Greg Kading. He made a documentary and printed a book claiming to solve both the murders of Tupac and Biggie. It was called Murder Rap. These works, in Kading's theory, has sowed confusion. And as recently as a few weeks ago, Kading decided that he wanted to go on the podcast Gangster Chronicles and discuss the work of Phil Carson and this podcast. I don't want to discount the investigation of Greg Kading on the murder of Biggie. I do want to address the theory and understand piece by piece why he has been so steadfast that the work he did solved both of these murders and that there was no involvement at all by LAPD officers. I want to thank Gangster Chronicles for the audio, which I plan to dissect and talk about through the course of this episode. 20 years ago, you were the lead detective on the Big Smoke case, right? I'm a journalist. Why is this case so important to you? A murder like that only goes unsolved if the police don't want to solve it. Here are the excerpts of Greg Kading's interview on the Gangster Chronicles podcast. Yeah, I would love to. I'd love to have the opportunity to kind of respond to the, you know, the claims that he's making. They're tired old allegations. This all goes back to the Russell Poole era of the Biggie Smalls murder investigation and these ideas that these um, rogue LAPD cops, David Mack in particular, was involved in the murder at the behest of Suge Knight, and then the LAPD covered it up. Well, <clears throat> and it was an interesting theory, and it's a theory we looked into when we investigated this originally. But at the end of the day, it's a theory that is just built on nothing but opinion and speculation. But yet it gains traction when it's not challenged. And so that's what I'm doing right now is to challenge Phil Carson to any type of debate that he chooses. And I want to challenge everything that he's postulated and said that, you know, in, in the, the general public, the audience is hearing his side of the story. And then you're only hearing one side of the story, then you tend to believe that it could potentially be true. And so I would like to challenge um, th those assertions that he's making um, and deal with him directly. And if not, then I'll do it indirectly. I'll sit here and refute everything that he said on your show. In this audio, Kading says that the story of Phil Carson harkens back to Russell Poole's theory. What he fails to talk about is a very clear thing. If Phil Carson was on the wrong track, with his FBI investigation, why did the city attorney in Los Angeles go to such lengths to stop Phil from finding the truth? Why did they hide evidence in a desk at LAPD's robbery homicide? And why did Michael Burkow, who worked directly for LAPD Chief Bill Bragg, make it a mission to work with LA Times journalist Chuck Phillips to print false and misleading stories it seems odd to me that all Kading can offer up here is that Russell Poole's theory is old. That isn't evidence. That isn't new information. Second, in all of Kading's interviews, I've yet to hear him talk about if he ever questioned David Mack, Rafael Perez, or Amir Muhammad, or if he ever ran ballistics on ammunition and guns found at Mack's house. Yeah, you know, and, and the truth is now coming out, man. Uh, uh, that's the way they're um, fixing it, right? That the whole LAPD, you know, orchestrated this whole elaborate cover-up to just go out and murder Notorious B.I.G. First of all, what's the motive? What would be the motive behind the LAPD just getting behind to go murder a hip-hop star? I don't understand it. Right, so he's going to claim that it's financially motivated, that David Mack did it because Suge Knight offered him money. 
but it goes way beyond the LAPD. If you follow his theory um, that he's uh, that he's postulating, you're talking about people from the FBI, people from the U.S. Attorney's Office, people from the District Attorney's Office, the LAPD, gangsters, all of these people, informants, everybody collaborating together. <clears throat> and if you do the work and actually figure out how big of a conspiracy this would demand, it becomes absolutely fucking ridiculous. Like all these people aren't gonna work together for what? Mm -hmm. To risk their reputations, their professional lives, all of this in order to cover up a murder of a rapper? Give me a break, it's ridiculous. And you can, it, but if people don't know better, if they're not armed with the, um, the, the, the counter equation, mm -hmm. then they assume it. I don't fault Greg Caden for not listening to this podcast. But I do fault him for going in a public forum and not having a sharp point of view. I have to find for you that Phil Carson's bosses at the FBI supported his investigation from start to finish. His bosses allowed him to open a sweeping public corruption case. And when he presented them with his prosecutive report, they asked him, why the case was not being prosecuted. As far as the United States attorney in LA, David Vaughn decided that he wouldn't prosecute, but never provided the FBI with a letter of declination stating why. His cover-up was orchestrated by a select group of people, all with motive and all with profound consequences if they went against the LAPD. The cover-up was by seasoned LAPD brass a city attorney inside Los Angeles that was very sophisticated. I think we have all seen, over the course of the last two years, the extent to which police in many departments across the country go to protect their own. That Kading is stating otherwise tells me two things. One, he isn't sophisticated enough to go on YouTube and provide real answers. His default mode is to attack people's character and never really address all the evidence and actions by police brass inside of three LAPD administrations. The nation erupted into scenes of chaos, <laughs> violence, oh my God. and widespread destruction into the early morning hours. Dozens of American cities up in flames after some protests turned into riots often followed by looting as a nation simmering with unrest unraveled. How long can you be peaceful when your people are dying? You know, uh, Big Gene Deal, you know, Big's bodyguard man, he said he got identified who he thought the suspect was. And um, Carson is like, um, he's going in with that. He's saying that this guy pretty much has already told everybody who the killer was and everything. Um, I don't know, man. Um, what do you think about, do you think Gene knows who did it, who done it? Gene don't have a fucking clue at all. He was in the car ahead and he looked behind him. The shooting already took place. He didn't see the shooter. He didn't have a clue who did it. But he, because he had already had some kind of little eye fucking contest with some guy in the parking lot, he assumes, well, I got a bad vibe from this guy and he looked at me in a certain way and so therefore that must have been connected to the murder, right? Mm -hmm. And then he identifies early on, shortly after the murder, he identifies some guy from a six pack who has nothing to do with anything. It was just a filler picture in a six pack. And Gene says, well, that looks like the guy. Well, guess what? It looks nothing like Amir Mohammed, mm -hmm. who he then later claims was the shooter. So if you're a witness and you say, well, this is what the guy looks like. And then later on, you pick out a picture of a guy who looks absolutely, completely different then what did you really see and what do you really know? Because there's no consistency in what you, per, what, what you claim to have seen. Kading has made it a business about going after Eugene Deal. Yet, if you listen to the story Gene has told for 20 years, it has never changed. Deal was with Puffy and everyone the night Biggie was murdered. Gene also understood the streets of New York and LA and had vast contacts into those worlds. Phil Carson has stated more than once on this podcast 
that LAPD robbery homicide investigator Steve Katz withheld or changed evidence inside the murder books. The same Steve Katz that had a locked and secret cabinet in his desk with David Mack's police misconduct file. Greg Kading to this day has never answered why the LAPD, if they truly wanted to solve this case, would hide evidence inside a desk. I challenge Kading to come on this very podcast and answer simple common sense questions like this. When he investigated the case, was he given David Mack's personnel file? Did Greg Kading interview Kenneth Boagney? Did Greg Kading have access to the internal affairs report that I've talked about that states LAPD internal affairs investigators believed that Rafael Perez and David Mack most likely played a role in the murder? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, the thing that the Carson guy said, man, he said he saw pictures of the two alleged crooked cops at the Peterson Museum in LA the night it happened. Um, but he said as soon as he started to solve the case, that people pretty much went out their way to discredit him. He said that there's this big scandal on, going on, people are trying to discredit him. Um, what do you think about all this, man? Well, he deserves to be discredited because what he's promoting is bullshit. You know, and it's not doing any good to anybody that actually cares about the truth of this matter. And so he claims, what I, what I believe he's claiming, is that there were some surveillance photographs of an individual that he says that he'd seen. Then when, we, he, then when he went back to meet with the LAPD and look at the files, mm-hmm. that that picture is no longer there. Well, every single picture from the Peterson Auto Museum surveillance cameras are in the case files. I have every single one of them. And so even if we removed him, those videotapes were still at the Peterson Auto Museum for anybody to go and subpoena. You know, we didn't have the originals, we had copies. And so what good does it do us to remove a photograph that we know somebody else can go get otherwise? What I found in my experience is that homicide investigators are very precise. They have to be. They parse their words and language. They don't operate in gray areas. Kading's comments here are off base. Phil Carson has never said that surveillance camera footage was missing or surveillance photographs. Phil has stated very clearly that actual photographs that were inside the murder book were removed. The photographs that not only Phil Carson talks about, Mario Hammonds talks about in his deposition. Photographs that show David Mack and Rafael Perez at death row events. Photographs that Steve Katz had in the murder book that were then removed. Phil Carson, throughout his career, has worked huge cases at the FBI, drug cases and public corruption cases. He has a very long and storied career. He was very clear about what happened with the murder books and robbery homicide. Kading, stating here about surveillance footage, is just plain wrong. And if you're going to attack the information inside this podcast, he should at least spend the time to listen and respond accordingly with his own facts. Yeah, well, you know what he said is um, that attorneys for the city of L.A., you know, they were being sued by Biggie's mom at the time, you know, Miss Wallace, rest in peace. They told him he could not testify in the cases that might cause them to lose. He even heard tape recordings where a senior LAPD official told the LA Times reporter to discredit him. He uh, he don't know what he's talking about, and he could derail the investigation. He had a beef with Chuck Phillips, right? So that's the LA Times reporter he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Because Chuck Phillips had an in at the LAPD and was getting information about what was happening in the investigation. And that rubbed them the wrong way. They didn't think this stuff, and it shouldn't be out there, but it was. So Mm -hmm. it it is what it is. But, you know, the... the, uh, the idea that this whole thing was a big, massive cover-up and conspiracy. All you have to do is sit there and think about what it would take to do this, and then it becomes so implausible. It just falls on his face. I guess Greg Kading thinks it's okay for a journalist to print the name of a confidential FBI informant. What is especially stupid about this comment is that Greg Kading knows better. 
he knows that something like Chuck Phillips printing the name of an informant is not any protocol that any law enforcement agency would ever be happy about or support. I've spent enough time inside police departments that what Chuck Phillips did at the LA Times, along with LAPD Deputy Chief Michael Burkow, is borderline criminal. I'm sure when Kading was working his gang cases or murder cases at the LAPD, he would never want the name of his informants printed in the press. In his own film, Murder Rap, he protected the identity of his main source and cooperator in his own Biggie investigation. So how, in this exchange, can he dismiss what happened to Psycho Mike Robinson? It's another sign of how unsophisticated he really is. What is truly sad is that this man for years now has been able to go on all these online platforms and go unchallenged. That has to stop now. What do you think this guy's motivation is? Because like, um, you know, how many years has it been? Since all you're doing is open up Rio rehashing old wounds for these family members that don't have to live through this stuff and now you bring in some other stuff up. What do you think, like, everybody's motivation is in this? Well, that's a great point. So here's a guy that claims that there was this big cover-up, including his own agency, right? Mm -hmm. Because in order for this to work, his own agency had to collaborate with the LAPD. Mm -hmm. And he's claiming that this was all, you know, a massive uh, effort. Well, what does it say about him that he believes that and then continues to work for them for 15 years before he tells his story? Phil Carson continued to work for the FBI after the Biggie Smalls investigation because as he has stated, and other sources have stated, the FBI were not a part of this cover-up. His direct bosses at the FBI supported prosecution of this case. Nowhere in anything that Phil has said, has he indicated the FBI did anything wrong. Greg Kading, once again, here has a platform and chooses to distribute misinformation. Do you see a pattern developing? The cover-up took place inside two entities, the LAPD and the city attorney for Los Angeles. The FBI never had to collaborate with the LAPD. Phil investigated the case his bosses supported it full stop. To go further, I've seen internal FBI documents that also support this narrative. You know, they're not being objective observers. They're just like, okay, here's your platform, tell your story. But, you know, the truth is an unchallenged lie, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And so you got to challenge these things. If people are interested in what happened, then you gotta, you, you, everyone has to stand and, and face each other and go, well, here's what I know and here's what you claim to know and, you know, work it out. So that's what I, you know, I'm hoping to do because it's important enough to, to, to work towards that. I'm embarrassed for you. That's what I would say to him. I'm embarrassed for you and you're an embarrassment to your agency because you should know better. I, I believe you believe what you're saying, but you don't have the due diligence done to go out and publicly say this. You're accusing demonstrably innocent people of horrific crimes. And that's reckless. And it's irresponsible and it's unfair. For what? If there's one thing that Phil Carson isn't, it's an embarrassment to the FBI. His career and morals are intact and his bosses and colleagues have supported his story and it's been verified by internal FBI and LAPD documents. What's embarrassing is going back and watching the murder rap documentary and companion book. Let me explain Greg Kading's theories and how he arrived at his evidence. When he was named the head of the task force to investigate the murder of Biggie by the LAPD in 2006, what he actually did first was spend time solving the Tupac murder. How the fuck he did this while he was an LAPD detective, I have no idea, as that was not his jurisdiction or what the task force was created for. I digress. In that case, he went after Keefe D, 
a member of the Southside Crips and orchestrated an undercover drug buy. We still believe that Keefe D was an enormous person of interest who could break the case wide open. Our first run at Keefe failed. He immediately lawyered up, and we realized we needed to find a way to compel him to cooperate. Because the case had been federalized, we became aware that the DEA was already investigating Keefe D and other Southside Crips for interstate narcotics trafficking. We used this information against one of Keefe D's drug couriers in order to convince him to flip against Keefe D. We then used that drug courier to set up Keefe D in a big drug sting involving cocaine and PCP. The operation took months. It involved wiretaps, surveillance, and undercover narcotic buys to ensure that we had an ironclad case with a life sentence that we could hold over Keefe D's head. So with this, we went to Keefe's house and confronted him with the evidence that we had built against him. Later that day, Keefe and his attorney met with us at the U.S. Attorney's Office in downtown Los Angeles. Keefe D has a serious dilemma on his hands. He either comes clean about what he knows about the murder of Biggie Smalls or he goes to prison for the rest of his life. Keefe agrees to cooperate with the government and that it will be a proffer session in which nothing that he tells us can be used against him unless we find out that he's deliberately lied to us. After he busted Keefe D with kilos of cocaine and PCP, Keefe D was looking at more than 30 years in prison. So Kading offers Keefe the opportunity to proffer or go on the record in exchange for a deal. At this point, we concluded that Keefe D's big bargaining chip was Tupac, not Biggie. People had always suspected that the murders of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls were connected, but now we were certain of it. With Keefe D's confession, we knew that if we could solve one murder, we would likely be able to solve the other. With a huge jail sentence hanging over his head, Keefe D tells Kading that Orlando Anderson killed Tupac in Las Vegas because an associate of Puffy was going to pay him, Keefe D, a million dollars. So in essence, Keefe solves a murder for Kading. Case closed. Congrats, Greg. After spending most of his book and documentary talking about the murder of Tupac, in the last 13 minutes of the film, Kading finally outlines how he solved the murder of Biggie. Kading was able to locate an old girlfriend of Suge Knight, who he gives the alias Teresa Swan. Suge's most trusted girlfriend, who we're going to refer to under the alias of Teresa Swan, was the mother of one of his children. She was also criminally complicit in some of Suge's nefarious business activities. Teresa Swan had a long history of fraud and perjury with a half a dozen fake identities. Our big break with Teresa Swan came when her name came up in the middle of an auto theft ring where the thieves were using fraudulent loan applications to purchase vehicles and then in turn selling them at a discount price. In addition to the evidence of her involvement in this auto theft ring, we discovered that she was involved in Suge Knight's bankruptcy fraud. So we now had two very serious things to hold over her head. We're about to ask Teresa Swan to do something against her every instinct. Drop the dime on Suge Knight. For the third meeting with Teresa Swan, the task force created a ruse. They drafted fake documents, including a driver's license with Poochie's photo under the name of Darnell Bolton, one of Poochie's known aliases. They also created a fake confession letter appearing to have come from Poochie before he died, signed under the same alias of Darnell Bolton. This authentic-looking fake confession letter detailed the murder as we believed it happened. Specifically, Poochie's fake confession stated that Suge Knight had hired him to kill Biggie in retaliation for the murder of Tupac. The letter then listed Teresa Swan as a co-conspirator to make her believe that Poochie had dropped the dime on her years earlier. To make it look more authentic, we put a fake law firm letterhead and redacted out certain sections. Lastly, the fake confession letter was dated April 1st, 1998, April Fool's Day. Kading and his cohorts draft up a fake confession letter that in the documentary film 
he calls conducting a ruse. Some people may take issue as whether or not they think it's an ethical approach to essentially lie to witnesses. Uh, we call it conducting a ruse. It's completely a, a standard that's used in law enforcement investigations all the time. It's much like in that scene from L.A. Confidential where the detective is playing two uh, suspects against each other that are in different interrogation rooms. It was essentially the same thing, except in this case, one of the suspects was speaking from the grave. Since they'd mentioned Teresa Swan by name in Pucci's fake confession letter, she was led to believe that she'd already been exposed and that now was a time to deal with it. So after she gains her composure, we show her this fake sheaf of documents, which she reviews and pauses, looking up at us and says, what Pucci said, that's what happened. In this ruse and letter, a man named Wardell Pucci Faust, who was an associate of Suge Knight, was paid $13,000 to kill Biggie. Teresa Swan reads the fake letter and then magically confesses to Greg Kading that she handled the logistics between Pucci and Suge in the murder of Biggie. At the end of Murder Rap, Greg Kading himself has an amazing quote a quote that sounds amazingly stupid. He states, his investigation did enough to disprove Russell Poole's theory and get the LAPD out from under a $400 million lawsuit. Now with Keefe D's confession and Teresa Swan's confession, both these parallel investigations are really starting to fall together. The murder of Tupac Shakur in Las Vegas and the murder of Biggie Smalls in Los Angeles. We have Keefe D ready to make another run at Zip in New York. And I'm writing an affidavit to wiretap Suge Knight's phone to solicit incriminating statements. We have accomplished in these three years of investigative work more than that had been accomplished in the previous decade. We're right at the threshold of solving both of these murders. And then the rug gets pulled out from under us. In hindsight, it appears that we accomplished exactly what the LAPD had wanted all along. Gather enough evidence to disprove Poole's theory and get out from under that potential $400 million lawsuit that Biggie's family had waged. Perhaps it was the LAPD's opinion. The shooters in both of these murders are dead. And although the co-conspirators are still walking free, maybe it's best just to let sleeping dogs lie. On the one hand, we had vindicated the department from those false allegations about being involved in the murder. But on the other hand, it was very disheartening having gathered the evidence that we did and the LAPD not having the fortitude to continue forward. I couldn't have stated it better. As to why this task force was created in the first place, Kading was stupid enough to say it himself in his own documentary. The common sense question that Kading hasn't answered anywhere is that if Teresa Swan and Suge were involved in the murder and Pucci was the shooter, why haven't the LAPD charged Teresa Swan or Suge Knight? Well, Pucci is conveniently dead, but that still leaves Suge and Teresa. Seems like a good way for all of the headaches of the LAPD to go away. Just charge Suge and Teresa. The problem with that is that the LAPD knows that Greg Kading is full of shit and that his investigation was a joke. It actually is his work and his book and documentary that were the greatest ruse. It has allowed the LAPD to not only confuse the public, it has allowed the civil case to remain in a state of limbo. Kading provided the fodder for Los Angeles city attorneys to blockade Perry Sanders and Valletta Wallace from their day in court, and justice for Biggie's family. It's causing further confusion for Valletta Wallace, who is like the last standing victim in all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, faith aside, you know, Valletta Wallace should have had clarity in what happened to her son. Yeah, and, exactly. and so much noise got in the way, so much confusion got in the way that it led her to a, a place where she's never going to have definitive answers. She's never going to have that peace of mind of knowing exactly what happened because there's too much bullshit in the way. 
And, you know, you've got to just, you've got to be able to look at the things for what they were instead of what you want them to be or what your preconceived notions are about how it went down. You've got to look at the facts and the evidence only and then let that determine what your, you know, what your conclusions are. For Greg Cading to utter Miss Wallace's name is an absolute disgrace. It's sick and twisted. And in closing, I will say this. Greg Cading can come onto this podcast at any time and answer common sense questions as to why, if his investigations were successful, why didn't the LAPD move forward? He can answer as to what happened with his own internal affairs investigation. He can answer as to why he supports Reggie Wright Jr., a known drug dealer and felon. He can answer as to who is Teresa Swan and why did he draft a fake confession letter to get her to talk. He can also answer why LAPD's robbery homicide decided to lock evidence and files inside of a desk. He can answer as to why the LA Times printed a series of false articles and that Chuck Phillips has disappeared to this day. He can also answer if he saw the internal affairs documents that stated Mac and Perez were involved in the murders. He can answer as to why he never questioned Rafael Perez, David Mack, or Amir Muhammad. Or he can answer why he thinks the lead city attorney for Los Angeles, Luis Lee, thought that Phil Carson was credible enough he was called into a meeting and told never to testify in the civil proceedings. The list goes on of questions that Kading ignores or chooses to attack the character of storied investigators like Russell Poole, Sergio Robledo, Phil Carson, and Richard Valdemar. And finally, maybe he can answer why after all these years that currently no one at the LAPD is looking to solve the murder of Biggie. Greg, if you're listening, my cell phone number is 646-363-6474. Text me, call me. You can come on and explain all of these things in your own words, unedited. We're talking about truth, and I've seen so many untruths among these so-called officials. My mother taught me something about truth. It's a poem. She said, speak the truth and speak it ever. Because he who hides the wrong he did does the wrong thing still. 20 years ago, I, uh, I made a false claim against your son. And? I was mistaken. Well, it takes a big man to admit that he makes a mistake. I, I didn't think that you guys would be on good terms. I mean... And why is that? Well, I mean, you know, your family's case and, and using his theory to support it and then it being dismissed. Oh, no, the case was not dismissed. It was a mistrial. Huge difference. A federal judge caught the LAPD hiding evidence that linked Mac and Perez to Christopher's murder and declared a mistrial. Now, here's the kicker. The city of L.A., they reopened the investigation because as long as it's an ongoing investigation, that evidence stays locked away in the dark. So we cannot sue LAPD because they are investigating the case. 